high altitude. So our big question, how have humans responded to life at high altitude? That's what we're going to find out today. In particular, we're going to talk first about high altitude ecosystems. Right, what makes them special or unique? What the, what the specific aspects of those ecosystems are that set them apart? We will talk about human physical responses to altitude. What happens to the body when you go up high? Then specifically, just like last week, we'll look at one group of people who live at altitude. In this case, the Sherpas and other peoples of the Tibetan Plateau. We're sort of mashing these groups together, and I'll explain why in a minute. And then lastly, I hope we have some time for some juicy discussion. So let's begin. High altitude ecosystems. First of all, the definition of high altitude can be a bit contingent. There's not necessarily a universally agreed upon standard. For our purposes, we might say that moderate altitude or altitude begins at something like 1,500 meters. And we might say that high altitude begins at something like 3,000 meters. Has anyone ever been this high? You have. Where was that? In an airplane. Oh, but I'm fine. Interestingly, uh, yeah, w what altitude do airplanes fly at? Like nine or 10,000 meters, yeah, yeah. But the cabin of the airplane, when you're inside, it's pressurized, right? Is it pressurized to sea level? It is not. That would be too expensive. What do the airlines pressurize it to? 1,500 meters. That's why your food tastes like crap and you sleep like a baby on an airplane. You get all dopey. You ever bring homework on a flight? You're trying to get reading done, and you kind of, oh, right? Do you guys notice this? And you ever, like, after a meal on an airplane, they turn the lights out, and 90% of the people in the cabin just sort of pass out? <laughs> yeah, yeah, because they're pressurizing it to altitude. This is interesting, and we'll talk about the effects of this in a moment. Huh. <laughs> okay, so the primary stress that occurs to us at altitude, the number one stress that makes high-altitude environments different, special, unique, is hypoxia. What is hypoxia? Hypoxia is a state of low oxygen pressure. It is a state of low oxygen pressure either in the environment or in the bloodstream. That's important. So hypoxia is a state of low oxygen pressure either in the environment or in the bloodstream. Why does this matter? Well, for those of you who are exercise physiologists or something, anyone interested in sport physiology? You can induce hypoxia in at least two ways that I can think of. Number one, you could walk up the side of a mountain. You could be at altitude, right? Get into an airplane. You'll be in a low pressure environment. The other way that you could induce hypoxia in the bloodstream instead of the environment is how? The opposite. Go running. Yeah, if you breathe in and out really fast, then you have, like, you have less time to keep the oxygen. Yeah, go for a jog. Right? That's why we start gasping when we're running. We are ticking over oxygen at a faster rate than our body is able to supply it to us, and we start getting tired, right? Hypoxia can be in the environment all around us because we're way up high in the mountains, or it can be in the bloodstream. You can create internal hypoxia, oxygen debt, we call it, by going out and exercising, right? So a lot of the mechanisms that we talk about, a lot of the phenomena that we talk about in high altitude ecology, high altitude physiology, will be very familiar to those of you that study, I don't know, soccer players, runners, whatever. They have very similar stresses, right? oxygen stress. Okay? All right. The second big stress in high altitude ecosystems is cold. They are, to some extent, energy limited environments. The most important thing to know about cold at altitude is this, what's called the environmental lapse rate, the ELR. Environmental lapse rate is the rate at which temperature decreases with increases in altitude.
In other words, the higher you go, the colder it gets. Yeah. How much higher, how much colder? Well, on Earth, at the altitudes at which we operate, I mean, this rule applies. You can do this in, you know, way, way up in space and on other planets and things. But on the surface of the Earth, for our purposes, the environmental lapse rate is about 6.4 degrees Celsius per thousand meters. How high is Mount Everest, we said, roughly? Say it's 8,000 meters. Yes, it's more, but say it's eight. Eight times six? I don't know, I'm asking you guys. So all else being equal, how much colder is it at the top of Mount Everest compared to the bottom? Oh, guys. 48 degrees colder, right? 48 degrees Celsius colder. 48 degrees Celsius is a lot, right? If it were 20 degrees above, I'll make it easier. If it was 28 degrees above, <laughs> at the bottom, at the very sea level of Mount Everest, right, on that latitude, then it would be minus 20, right, at the very top. So, environmental lapse rate is important. As we go up, it gets colder. Doesn't matter what latitude you're at, as a matter of fact. This happens universally, all over the world. Okay, that's important. The other interesting thing to note, right, when we think about mountains, uh, I always talk about the Himalayas, that's the one that we'll mostly talk about today. What latitude is Nepal at? I mean, the top of that country is the highest in the world, right, 8,000 meters. And the south of that country borders against India. There are tigers walking around in the south of Nepal, right? And in the foothills of Mount Everest, there are monkeys swinging through rhododendron trees. Nepal's at the same latitude as Florida, right? So this is essentially a tropical, right, at the very base of it, a tropical ecosystem. And at the top of it, the environmental lapse rate reduces it to this glaciated wasteland, right? Minus 40 degrees at the top. So the latitude factor is far less important than the altitude factor when we talk about humans in high altitude ecosystems. The other important thing to remember about the cold and the reason why people at high altitudes are different from, let's say, people in just cold climates is that the cold at altitude is not constant. All right? Okay, perhaps if you're on a mountain in Alaska or something. But in most of the high altitude areas around the world where we're interested in studying the peoples there, the Andes, the Himalayas, the plateau of East Africa, Ethiopia, Kenya, then what we're really interested in is the fact that it might be cold at night, let's say, very cold at night, but it's not cold during the day. There's actually plenty of solar radiation. Remember, even Mount Everest is at this tropical latitude. So when the sun's out, it's lovely. Right. Cold is not the limiting factor. When we think about the law of the minimum, right? So the primary stress in this environment is not cold. It does get cold, and we do see some responses to that. But the limiting factor is not cold. The limiting factor is hypoxia. That's the chief stress. Other problems with high altitude ecosystems, low biological productivity. We talked about this last week, right? In, in Arctic ecosystems, colder at night, right? This means that things tick over more slowly. High neonate mortality. What is a neonate? Anybody speak Latin? God, yeah. yeah. <laughs> really, for the biologists in the room especially, you should take Latin. It helps you so much. Neonate. Neo means new, yeah? Nate? Yeah. Born. Spanish speakers, Italian speakers, yeah. This is what you're saying? Yes. Thank you. Newborns. Neonates are newborns. The strict medical definition of neonate is any child under the age of four weeks. All right? Call it a month. If you die under the age of four weeks, then that's considered neonatal mortality. Older than that, then you would start to get into what we would call infant mortality instead, if we're, if we're being very strict hey, uh, about this definition. There are a handful of reasons why this might be the case. Cold stress, believe it or not, uh, is implicated sometimes. Bathing a child that's newborn, that's a few days old, right? If you don't swaddle very, very carefully at high altitude, overnight that child could be incredibly cold. Babies can't shiver, right? And unless they're extremely well fed, that base metabolic rate reaction is going to be tough, might not be adequate. But 
Probably more important is just the fact that at these high altitudes, hypoxia is the real limiter, right? The placental environment that the child is growing up in might be oxygen deprived, and that can be very dangerous. All right. Obviously, as far as Darwin's concerned, this is a massive stress. Right? This cuts right into your reproductive fitness at the point of reproduction. So if you're not able to have viable offspring, then you're a dead end as far as Uncle Charles is concerned. Right? Very important. In terms of other stresses that make high altitude environments uh, tricky, special, different, um, they're often very arid, surprisingly. There might be lots of snow and ice around, but uneven rainfall or precipitation. Some of it might come in the form of snow, might come in monsoon cycles. I say infrastructure. What I mean to say by that is that uh, it's tough in mountains to build stuff, right? Roads, fields, irrigation programs, and so on. We can do more in an arid desert than we can in an arid mountainous environment, all else being equal, because mountains are tricky to work in, right? It just takes a long time to get from here to there. When I was living on Mount Everest, when I wanted to get groceries, I had to walk two days south and three days north again, right? By the end, I got really fit, I got well acclimated, and I could get down in one day and back up in two. It was a three-day round trip to get groceries. Unless you wanted to take a helicopter, you were walking. Right? You're walking at extremely high altitudes. It's very taxing. You're hypoxic. Right? The terrain is very uneven. It just gets difficult to do some stuff. Right? So similarly, mobility is a bit of a problem. Can be. Right? We have plenty of evidence of high altitude plateaus that are nice and flat, where people can be nomadic, right? pastoralists. But we also have examples of really steep mountainous areas where getting from point A to point B is very, very demanding. And so these thousand mile migrations are very, very impractical. Right? Too much work. And then lastly, this question of soil and farming is, is a tricky one. Mountain environments are often marginal or only able to grow because of their low biological productivity, certain kinds of crops. You might not have the same options for variety that you do at lower altitudes where more things can grow. Interesting thought about uh, high altitude ecosystems by way of sort of conclusions is how variable they can be compared to a big wide open grassland. Is anybody here from the prairies? Uh, you can see a, a thunderstorm coming for days and days, right, in Saskatchewan. And in the mountains, it's the exact opposite. Things are very variable, they change fast, and from place to place, very different. You know that company called the North Face? Everybody knows the North Face. Why are they called the North Face? Because in the northern hemisphere, and to some extent the south, the north face of a mountain is almost always the hardest one to climb. <coughs> Why? Thinking caps. Come on, ecologists. Why would the north face be harder? Because it gets no sun. Right. It's colder. And if you're on a, an especially steep mountain, right, it gets no sun at all. Always going to be cold. Always going to be dark subject to a lot of uh, rock fall, ice fall, right? So these are chillier places. So mountains, uh, if you imagine them as just having four sides, you can imagine four extremely different environments at different times of day on each side of the mountain, even if the mountain itself is relatively small. So variety is really important to bear in mind with mountain ecosystems, and it's important to know that it's hard to compare place to place, right? The next valley over, it might be raining, and in this valley, it's sunny. This is how the mountains work. All right? This is mountain ecosystems. So then what about human bodies? What would happen if I sent you guys to the top of Mount Everest right now? Anyone? Probably die. You would die. That is correct. Straight up. Uh, for a variety of reasons, Acute mountain sickness is just a case of normally bad uh, headaches, nausea, things like that. But one of the biggest worries at altitude is what's called edema. Those of you that are interested in health will see edema in post-surgical patients sometimes. If you put someone under general and bring them, cut their appendix out and bring them out, you might see edema. You clear that with diuretic drugs like Lasik or something like that. 
right, acetazolamide. Why does this happen in low pressure environments? Anyone? When you've got less pressure, that means that the, the pressure right now in your lungs that's pushing out the bad stuff is reduced. Right? So the two most common types of edema at high altitude are cerebral, which is the head. In other words, fluid starts to pool on your brain. This kills you very, very quickly. Or pulmonary, fluid starts to pool in your lungs. You're simply not able to keep a positive pressure balance, okay? and fluid then starts to leak in. And when that happens, you start to drown in your own lungs. If you go high enough fast enough, somewhere over 10 kilometers, vertically, then your blood boils. You also die very quick, quickly when that happens. Remember the environmental lapse rate? Temperatures get lower and lower as we get higher and higher. As endotherms, our blood temperature remains the same. The ambient temperature goes down. That means that as we go higher and higher up, pressure decreases and boiling point decreases. So when you're on Everest, your water is boiling at 85 degrees instead of 100 degrees. What's human body temperature? 36. If you go high enough, you will reach a point, uh, not on any mountain on Earth, happily, but if you go high enough in a spaceship or something, you'll reach a point at which your blood temperature is boiling point compared to your ambient temperature. That will kill you very fast as well. So we see, ladies and gentlemen, the limits of culture. We spoke last week about how the Inuit respond so beautifully through regulatory mechanisms to the cold. If you were to attach a wee thermometer to an Inuk who was walking around the tundra and similarly attach one to a Scarberian who was walking around Scarborough, their microclimates would in fact be very, very similar very, very similar temperatures in the little bubble around their bodies. Why? Because Inuit clothing is so damn good. You can regulate your way out of a lot of cold problems, but you cannot regulate your way out of hypoxia. Does that make sense? There's virtually nothing that we can do to stick more oxygen into the air, to increase the partial pressure of O2. There's no amount of behavior changes that are going to fix that. There's exactly one regulatory mechanism that humans have come up with so far, and it's not very practical. What is that? The oxygen tank, exactly. Sticking on a mask, right, and breathing extra oxygen to compensate for the relative lack of oxygen around you. Not really a sustainable long-term solution to hypoxia. So it's the overriding stress in the environment. It's also one that's really hard for us to fix right? By putting on another jacket or lighting a fire or something. Okay? So, what happens to human bodies at altitude? Well, we certainly see some morphological changes. High altitudes are generally a little bit colder, so it's fair to say that we see some of the Allen's, Bergman's type uh, morphological changes at high altitudes, at least at some high altitudes. Right? In environments where it's particularly cold, then we would expect people to have shorter appendages, right? Shorter fingers, shorter arms and legs, shorter, uh, smaller ears and noses, right? So we do see a bit of that. The other one that we see a lot of, differences in chest circumference, right? That has nothing to do with the cold, that has everything to do with altitude. Why would you want a larger chest? Precisely. We think that having a larger chest will give you larger lung capacity. It literally just gives you a bigger garbage bag in here that you can inflate. <sighs> you know. The oxygen itself, uh, or sorry, the air <laughs> that you're breathing is poorer in oxygen. So to compensate for that, you breathe more of it. Right? You also see a few other morphological changes that are really interesting, just starting to be understood, especially changes in uh, blood flow. Right? So there's some evidence that in Tibet, among native Tibetans, we see increased amounts of cerebral blood flow, more blood going up to the brain. Why would you want more blood going to the brain? It's a good insulator, yeah, sure. Yes. 
Yeah, exactly. So we have two concerns. Number one would be like circulating warmth, and number two would be simply providing enough oxygen. Remember, hypoxia is our limiting factor here. The body's going to keep trying to deal with hypoxia at altitude. So if the air that you're breathing is poorer in oxygen, you have a few choices, blood being our transport medium for oxygen. One solution is, well, the blood itself isn't as rich, let's deliver more of it, right? As a way to compensate. Okay. Another response. This is one of my favorites. The HVR. <laughs> uh, HVR is a short form for the hypoxic ventilatory response. This one I like because you can feel it right away. It's very interesting if you go up to altitude. Ooh. So next time you go on holiday somewhere exciting, think hypoxic ventilatory response. Basically, the definition of HVR is it is an increase in ventilation. What is ventilation? Breathing, yeah, inhale and exhale. The HVR is an increase in ventilation induced by hypoxia, as the name suggests, right? Pretty straightforward. Why do you want to hyperventilate when you're hypoxic? I mean, this is not something super exotic. If you've ever gone running in your life, you've experienced the hypoxic ventilatory response, right? When you start running, you start breathing faster. Why? More oxygen? Number one, yeah, working muscles need more oxygen. And? Uh, and less CO2, exactly. Never underestimate the importance of the negative end of that loop. A lot of us tend to think of oxygen inputs as the limiter. There's plenty of evidence that it's the exhaust pipe that's the hard part. You need to get rid of CO2. It's bad for us. It's acidic, right? So that prompts a handful of reactions from our body. One of which is the fascinating fact that our kidneys, among their various rules, store bicarbonate. Any bakers in the class? What's bicarbonate? Baking soda. <laughs> Sodium bicarb. Is it basic or acidic? It is basic, yeah. These, the baking soda and vinegar reaction that we all do as kids, right? Your kidneys store a little bit of bicarb in them. When you start working really hard at high altitude, one of the first things that happens to you often is you feel like you have to go pee. Because your kidneys are kicking into gear and saying, getting a little bit acidic in here, right? quite a lot of CO2 going around, bit of lactic acid, why don't I just squeeze out some bicarb? buffer things, right? Neutralize the pH. And when your kidneys start squeezing things out, naturally your bladder says, oh, hey, right? Pull over, please. <laughs> fascinating, fascinating stuff. Don't worry, that will not be on the test. HVR probably will, though. That's important. Uh, all right. So the aim of HVR is then just basically to maintain oxygen saturation. Right? This is a, a strategy for your body in the absence of enough oxygen, in a hypoxic environment, it's a way of maintaining your body's oxygen saturation. You need O2. This is one of your key currencies in your body, and without it, you don't last very long. Right? So this is how your body deals with that. Interestingly, when we study sort of uh, world champion mountain climbers and stuff, like the great, uh, the people who scale Mount Everest without extra oxygen and stuff, Reinhold Messner was the first person to do it. Have people heard of him? He was an Austrian guy who, in the 70s and 80s, climbed all these mountains. Super, super fantastic mountaineer. Took him into exercise physiology labs, they did, and hooked him up to all sorts of tests and found that in most respects, he was a totally ordinary guy. Did not have phenomenal VO2 max, strength, endurance. What he had was an awesome HVR. Right. This seems to be trainable. As soon as his body detected hypoxia, his ventilation rate started to increase. Right? And he was able to maintain that response. It was always robust, even if he was tired. Right? Now think about some of these things like living at altitude. Remember, the hypoxia never goes away. You can't regulate away from hypoxia. So you're breathing quickly. 
You've all done that because you've all gone running, and as you're running, you're breathing a bit faster. Now imagine that you're living at high altitude, so you have to breathe like that all the time. What happens when you go to sleep? You have to keep breathing like that. Sleeping while you're sort of gasping for air, like you're halfway through a marathon or something. Imagine. Exhausting, right? A lot of people find that very claustrophobic. They find they can't maintain it. Some people at altitude slip into what's known as Shane Stokes breathing, which the body can't keep up the HVR for a while and takes a break and you literally stop breathing for a while. When you're sharing a tent with somebody, you know, you look over and they're just stop breathing and then <gasps> after a minute they gasp and start breathing again. Shocking stuff. So one of the things we find is that the very best of the mountaineers very often have a super robust hypoxic ventilatory response. Their body seems really oxygen hungry and really able to sort of ramp up the reaction when it notices that there's not enough oxygen around. Super cool. Ah, I love it. Uh, okay, other changes to body tissues for sure, some blood changes. RBC stands for your red blood cells. So they are the commonest type of cells in our body, the red blood cells. Their primary role is as a transporter. Let's think of red blood cells as the transporter. What do they transport? No. No. Hemoglobin. This is important. It's a small distinction, but a, an important one for those of you especially that are thinking about writing your paper about altitude or something. This is key. HG short for hemoglobin, those of you who are going to work in uh, medical labs and, and in hospitals and stuff. RBC and HG, similar but different, right? What is hemoglobin? It is a protein. It's found in red blood cells and it's hemoglobin that binds on to oxygen. Okay? So the role of hemoglobin is as the sticky protein it attaches some oxygens to it, and then it travels around the body, right, dropping off those oxygens. So red blood cells, the transporter, hemoglobins are the actual oxygen delivery. So you could imagine two ways of solving a hypoxic problem. You could increase your total red blood cell count, right, so that you had more transporters with the same amount of hemoglobin, or you could increase the amount of hemoglobin. Same number of red blood cells, they're just carrying more hemoglobin. Or you could do both. And as it turns out, there's some neat evidence about how different altitude populations have adapted to altitude and to hypoxia, and it seems like that's a key difference. Right? There are different ways to solve this problem. What is your hematocrit? Blood viscosity. Yeah, essentially it's your blood viscosity. So, hematocrit is the percentage of your total blood, the volume of blood, that is made up of red blood cells. So hematocrit is the percentage, and we measure it, like in the lab you can test your hematocrit and they'll give you back a number like 45, which would be about right. Your hematocrit is the percentage of your total blood volume that is made up of red blood cells. We heard, you said viscosity, why is that? Go. That's right. So we can affect hematocrit in a few ways. One of those is by increasing the number of red blood cells. Another is by increasing their size, right? By enlarging them. And uh, actually, as it turns out, by being dehydrated. If you're dehydrated, then the total amount of water in your blood, right, is less and less and less, which means that relatively speaking, the proportion of your blood that is made up of red blood cells must increase and therefore your hematocrit increases and eventually your blood gets goopy. Yeah. There were, uh, years ago, there were a whole bunch of cyclists in the Tour de France that were dying of strokes halfway through bike races because they were doping their blood, right? They wanted to have lots of red blood cells, more oxygen transport, better endurance. They were halfway through a 200 kilometer bike race on a hot day so they were massively dehydrated and eventually their blood is just turning to toothpaste, you know? super, super thick and goopy, heart's unable to pump it around anymore, and then they tip over. Yeah. 
So, infinitely increasing hematocrit, not necessarily an option, right? You need to find some ways to become efficient at transporting oxygen around the body without pushing hematocrit into the danger zone and becoming super viscous. This happened to me on a research trip to Nepal. I went with a physiologist who was doing blood research. Those of you who are interested, endlessly fascinating stuff. We were, uh, he was testing our red blood cell counts as we went. We had a little portable hemoglobin monitor and we would lie there in the tent at night, you know, drawing blood. It was really painful and awkward. And eventually my hematocrit started to get phenomenally high to the extent that we started thinking, oh, maybe we should start taking aspirins or something, just in case. So, but then as it happened, I was very happy at altitude. I adjusted very well. I felt very fit. So, hmm, dangerous adjustment. Is that a question? Yeah. Alrighty. The question is, what about iron? What about iron? Why would it do that, do you think? Right. So iron, thank you, super question. So iron is a crucial ingredient of this entire process, right? Uh, and plays a key role in the oxygen transport uh, process in the blood. So is iron a limiting factor? Good question. Do you want to find out for us for next week? Oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> All right. Good. Uh, and then lastly, there's some evidence of non-shivering thermogenesis. We talked about cold as being one of the stresses in this environment. When humans go to altitude, certainly one of their strategies is to turn up the furnace. And burn more calories. Keeps us warmer. Now, one of the fascinating things about especially well-adapted people at altitude is that they seem to be able to turn up their HVR without a big metabolic cost. We talked about the Inuit, for instance, as being able to turn over not just calories but also oxygen faster, right? Metabolizing more CO2 and more O2 so that their total energy cost was nice and high and they stayed warm. But it appears under especially well uh, adjusted, well adapted uh, people at high altitude, this HVR doesn't cost them more calories. They can burn their calories in other ways. We'll talk about that in a second when we get on to diet. All right. Shall we talk about the Sherpas? Let's. This is a, a friend of mine. She's a nurse. Worked at a, a clinic. Uh, I won't bother telling you her name. Sherpas are named after the day of the week that they're born on. So there's seven names. And everybody's last name is Sherpa. <laughs> right? So you could be Pemba or Dorji or Mingma or Nima. And then your last name is Sherpa. So you end up meeting a lot of people like, oh, hi, I'm Nima Sherpa. And so is this and so is she. You know, right? <laughs> so yeah, male, female names don't really happen. Uh, and then you can modify your first name with a second name that's like an adjective, like brave or happy or lucky or something like that. So you meet a lot of Pemba Dorjis or Angnimas or whatever. Uh, yeah. So if I told you that her name was sort of Angnima, it wouldn't really make a difference. <laughs> We're going to talk today about the Sherpas and about other peoples of the Tibetan plateau. Look, we're going to speak at first about the Sherpas, and then we're going to speak about other people who live on the generally what we would call the Tibetan plateau. There are a few important things to note. Uh, the Sherpas, properly speaking, when we speak about Sherpa people, we're talking generally about a group who live in Nepal. Nepal is the world's only uh, Hindu country by way of state religion, but the Sherpas are Buddhists and they share much more in common linguistically and culturally, and we will find out, I think, genetically, with people who live in Tibet. Tibet was uh, recognized by some international countries as a sovereign state up until the 1950s when China occupied it, and now it's, I believe, known as a sort of semi-autonomous region or province of China. So politically, we are talking about a conflicted area of the world, right? Obviously, the borders between Nepal and uh, China are not wide open. You don't sort of wander across, right? China's borders are plenty hard, and Nepal over the years has had its fair share of political upheavals as well. But when we speak about the Sherpas, we're also going to talk a little bit later about some traditions that we find on the northern side of the border in Tibet. 
which properly speaking, I suppose today is China. So uh, bear that in mind as we go. Um, linguistically, the word Sherpa means people who come from the East. The East people, Sharpa. Um, the language that the Sherpas speak is essentially a Tibetan language, uh, but Sherpa is not written. It's only a spoken language, and the languages are not really mutually intelligible. Sherpas and Tibetans uh, can't exactly understand one another very well. Um, the general idea is that today's Sherpas probably arrived in the area around Mount Everest, the Solukhumbu Valley in northern Nepal, let's say three to six hundred years ago. It's a bit of a range. As for people in Tibet, of whom the Sherpas we, we consider a sort of group, the idea is that probably today's Tibetans are the descendants of people who arrived there about 3,000 years ago. 3,000 years, not a super long time, right? So one of the fascinating things that we find about Tibetans, they are adapted to altitude, and we say adapted and not adjusted. There are population level genetic changes among the Tibetans. But the Tibetans only got to Tibet when? 3,000 years ago. So far, in the scientific record, this is about the fastest case of evolution that we've ever seen. Super exciting stuff. So as it turns out, when we're studying genetic differences in Tibetan populations, we're really at the very cutting edge. Right? When we wonder how fast can evolution really happen, how fast can adaptation to an environmental stress really occur, as it turns out, well, 3,000 years. Probably less. Right? Super exciting. Uh, among the Sherpas, among the Tibetans, uh, let me back up for a sec. We were talking about blood just now. One of the key differences that we see in terms of their ability to adapt, uh, that's, that's obvious right away, is that they do not have higher hemoglobin. Not even necessarily higher red blood cell counts. What they have is higher ventilation. So that hypoxic ventilatory response keeps coming back, must be important, right? This is different. This makes the Tibetans different from other high altitude populations, right? When you compare them to people in other, yes? Sorry, who has the higher ventilation? The Tibetans do, okay. right. Uh, uh, Tibetans and, and the Sherpas, right? We're considering these as a, as a homogenous group for, for physical reasons right now. Draw blood from people from Scarborough, from people from Peru, and people from Tibet, and you find that in other high altitude environments, like the Andes, possibly Ethiopia, that you see blood level changes that people want to grow more hemoglobin, higher red blood cell count to compensate for hypoxia, but not the Tibetans. Pretty normal blood profiles, but instead, higher ventilation. So they compensate for hypoxia by breathing more, right? And this is different, this is special. One of the fascinating things about that fact, among several others that we're going to learn, is that it suggests that the human body is plastic, right? It reinforces that idea that there are multiple ways to react to the same challenge. That just because a bunch of humans move to high altitude in different parts of the world doesn't mean that they're going to react in the same way. They can all address hypoxia, right? They just might choose different mechanisms to do it. The reason for the distribution of those mechanisms might be selective, it might be random, we don't actually know right now. But that there are a lot of ways to skin a cat, I'm sorry to the cat fans, and it turns out this is the way that Tibetans have chosen to skin the hypoxia cat. Yes, are you a fan of cats? I'm so sorry. <laughs> yes. No, <laughs> sorry, yeah. Uh, I should, yeah, I should be a bit more careful in my language. No, this is the way that uh, natural selection has unfolded in this particular group, right? So clearly among the Tibetans, we have not selected for extremely high hemoglobin. That would have been one way to solve the problem. That would have been one way to skin the hypoxia cat. Instead, natural selection here has selected for 
higher ventilation. Right? And the hypoxia cat is skin. <sighs> All right. <laughs> In terms of specific genes that we think are associated with this, we can now actually map some of these out. The technology has gotten a lot better. <coughs> Research just published, just, just published this year, uh, by Huerta Sanchez and friends suggests that you can find these changes on the EPAS1 gene that predict hypoxic ventilatory response, among others. This is endlessly fascinating to me. Oof. Are there any sort of uh, archaeologists or bioanth types in the room? Right. Have you heard of the Denisovins? Yes. Who are the Denisovins? Or Yeah, so this is fascinating. Thank you. We've had a few tries at, at the genus Homo, right? Homo sapiens is mostly what's sitting in this room, but we also had Neanderthalensis, right? The Neanderthals, which were a crack at being modern humans that didn't quite work out. Their lineage seems to have died off, and for a long time we figured that was about it. Very recently, a few years ago, some people were poking around in a cave in Siberia and found a finger bone, a tiny finger bone. Ran it through the lab to check the genes, and they found out this is genus Homo, but not sapiens, not Neanderthalensis. This is a different kind of Homo. This is Homo Denisova, which is the name of the cave where this stuff was found, the Denisova cave in Siberia. Fascinating. So it looks like we've had multiple tries at doing the Homo sapiens thing. Sapiens, sapiens, us, are the ones that won that prize, but there were lots of others. At least two that we know of so far. And when we check the genes of the Denisovans, do they have the EPAS1 gene? Yes. yes, they do. So, is this a lingering after effect of some sort of gene sharing, some sort of reproduction with the Denisovans? Oh, I hope so, because that would be so fascinating. Right? So perhaps this trait arrives in Tibetan populations because of their proximity to northern and central or, or uh, yeah, Central Asia, let's call it. And maybe populations of archaic human ancestors, genus Homo, were living there and we shared some genes with them. Fascinating. Ah. All right. So, if you're a Sherpa, what do you do for a living? In short, you do what's called high-altitude agro-pastoralism. Agro-pastoralism is just a mixture of agriculture and what is pastoralism? Shepherding. Yeah, shepherding, keeping animals, keeping livestock. That traditionally has been how Sherpas pay the bills how they put food on the table. Now, what kind of crops are you growing at altitude? Not too many, right? Some problems with solar energy, but especially some problems with altitude. Not everything can grow that high. Low biological productivity, low amounts of variation. So, historically, it's been a great climate for tubers. What are tubers? Potatoes, yeah, stuff that grows underground. So potatoes, carrots. Uh, and, and then traditionally, before the potato, some types of kind of turnips and, and uh, like beetroot type vegetables. You have never seen someone eat potatoes until you've seen a Sherpa eat potatoes. <laughs> we will talk about that in a second. Uh, in terms of other, uh, buckwheat was a common grain. Buckwheat will grow up a little bit higher. Things like rice, absolutely not. Rice, very temperature sensitive. Wheats and things, not exactly, but buckwheat will work. Potatoes, carrots, buckwheat, that's a lot of carbs, right? Tons of starchy carbs. Big, long, complex carbohydrates. There are some very interesting implications about that that we will talk about in a second. Uh, in terms of those animals, can you guys see those animals? This is my friend whose name was Ang Searing, Sherpa. <laughs> uh, and he's bringing his yaks up to pasture. You guys have heard of yaks? Yeah, they're the enormous 
bovid animals, they're sort of related to the cow, ungulates, they've got cloven feet, right, they're mammals. And they're like a supercharged version of a cow, enormously warm coats, and they thrive at high altitudes. Interesting fact about the yak, its maximum operating temperature is about plus 15. Anything warmer than 15 degrees Celsius in the yak is in heat stress, can't handle it. It's wearing too warm a coat. This is why it's so great to be a human. We can take our coats off, right? The yak cannot. Number two, yaks thrive at altitude. So cold temperatures, they're perfectly happy with. In fact, they prefer cold temperatures. And we see the same in other species. There are types of dog, uh, Samoyed dogs, uh, popular in, in Sweden, northern Sweden, absolutely hate it if it's plus 15 out, right? They work best at the minus 15, minus 20. That's their ideal sort of range for exercise and stuff. Uh, similarly, the sort of operating floor, we would say the lowest altitude at which yaks work is 3,000 meters. That's incredibly high. Anybody ever go skiing out west? That's like the top of the Rocky Mountains. You know, 3,000 is about as high as you get in Canada, generally speaking. And this animal doesn't want to go below 3,000. It can go up, though, as high as I mean, 6,000 meters. 6,000 meters is incredibly high, top of Mount Kilimanjaro high. Yeah. Yes? Why would it not go below 3,000? All righty. Why would it not go below 3,000? Heat's going to be one problem, right? Blood viscosity? What was the problem with blood viscosity? Remember the cyclists? They doped a bunch, right? They had super rich red blood cell count. You go down to sea level to an oxygen rich environment, high heat environment, you run into a blood problem. Okay? Eventually your blood is maladapted to low, warm, oxygen rich environments, right? You get to a point where you've pushed far enough in that direction. And yaks, obviously, don't fool yourselves, they've been very selectively bred for a very long time to thrive at high altitudes. The other thing that we see, incidentally, with yaks is crossbreeding, right? Half cow, half yak crossbreeds that are, that are common as well. So they have a lower range of uh, temperatures, or sorry, a bigger range of temperatures and a lower altitude range that they can operate at. Okay. So. Yaks are also, of course, symbolically, since we're anthropologists, a source of prestige, a symbol of wealth. It's good to have lots of yaks. People will know that you're a serious person if you have dozens of them outside your house. And then in addition to agro-pastoralism, this is very, very important, the Sherpas have always supplemented with trade. And in fact, agro-pastoralism itself has never really been a 100% self-sufficient subsistence strategy for the Sherpas, okay? So it's never been about living entirely encapsulated. We saw that with the Inuit, right? The ability to get just about everything you need out of this environment. And the Sherpas, that's never been the case. The mission has never been to grow all of your own food, right? They supplement with trade. Always, always, always. Specifically, they want to trade for things that they can't grow up high, right? Rice being the obvious one, so they go, downhill towards India, right? Get a bunch of rice, trade for what they have up high, like wool, minerals, things like that. And then go back up, sell things along the way. So historically, the Sherpas were not just, you know, geographically isolated agro-pastoralists. In fact, they were the opposite. They were the roamers. They were the adventurers who would go far and wide. Very successful, right? Had a real tradition of brokering trade between the highlands and the lowlands, going all the way north into today's China, all the way south into today's India, and right, applying those trade routes really successfully. So diet. Now last week we spoke about the Inuit and eating a, a massively protein and, and fat dense, almost carbohydrate free diet that was con composed mainly of meat. This builds very nicely off last week's discussion about meat and off Shiva's discussion, thank you very much, about meat. What do the Sherpas eat? Well, we've said they eat a whole lot of carbohydrates, right? Let's put some numbers on that. Average Sherpa eats 
one kilogram of potatoes a day. Yeah, that's a base, base. Minimum one kilogram of potatoes per day. Yeah, I'm Irish and I don't eat that many potatoes. <laughs> that's, that's a shocking amount of potatoes, right? In addition to that, when I used to run down from the, from the base camp in order to buy my groceries, this was the lady that I would buy my carrots from. I think her name was, what, Pemba Searing, Dorji, Nimag. <laughs> uh, and I once asked, you know, can I take your picture? And she sort of, no. Uh, that's, <laughs> that's a lot of my interactions. We're going to talk about how friendly the Sherpas are in a minute, and they really are. <laughs> it's, it's early in the morning, and she was kind of tired. So. First of all, massively rich in carbohydrates, this diet. Massively rich in carbohydrates. Uh, we said that the Inuit, they need carbs, because we all do, right? Brain needs carbohydrate. It's the only fuel it uses, right? But the Sherpas are able to, or sorry, the, the Inuit are able to synthesize carbohydrate from the protein that they eat, right? It's expensive in the sense of costing them a lot of energy, but they can chop up those proteins and make sugars out of them. That has the benefit for them of also being thermogenetic. It increases work. You've got to tick over more energy, which warms you up from the inside out. The Sherpas can't afford that. They are metabolizing in a hypoxic environment. No amount of warm coats can stuff more oxygen into their bodies, and so they need to get their carbs from carbs. Right? Carbs are the cheapest fuel we've got. Right? They burn fast, they burn easy. So in a low oxygen environment where work is very expensive, carbs make sense. And actually, this is so fascinating, we can actually see Sherpa cardiac tissues, in other words, the heart muscles of Sherpas show a marked preference for carbohydrate compared with lowlanders like most of us. They can make greater use of carbohydrate to do their metabolism than most other people. If you're remembering sort of biology 101, why would your heart want to burn carb instead of fat? What's the body's key sort of energy currency? Three letters. ATP, adenosine triphosphate, right? Each molecule of carbohydrate gives you, depending on the carb, something like 25 to 60 percent more ATP than a molecule of fat. For us, here, at sea level, as lowlanders, our heart is happy to burn fat. Our bodies have lots of it, right? It's easy to store, and it's a good, efficient energy source. And as long as you're not working too hard and burning slowly, fat's a nice energy source. At high altitude, not efficient enough. Right? So if the Inuit diet is built around the idea of frankly being inefficient and generating all sorts of waste in the form of heat, the Sherpa diet is the exact opposite. They want to mainline that ATP, get it straight into working muscles, and in fact send that sugar directly to the heart, even some research suggests to the brain, where their tissues have adapted to make better use of carbs than the rest of us. Fascinating. So we see a diet, go figure, that's very rich in carbohydrates. What else do we see? Do the Sherpas eat meat? Well, <laughs> the morality argument is very interesting. We said that Nepal is a Hindu country, right? But that the Sherpas are not. They are Buddhist. Do Buddhists eat meat? Well, they can, <laughs> is the answer to this question. Buddhists take a hard line on other living animals, though, right? You shouldn't kill other animals. That's bad. We are animals, right? We're all joined together in this world. So one finds that the Sherpas outsource butchering. They'll eat meat, they just won't kill the animal themselves. You get lowlanders to do that for you. The second thing that one finds a lot of when you hang out in, in Sherpa country is stories of cows and goats and yaks that accidentally fell off a cliff or something. You know, what are we having for dinner tonight? Oh, we're having yak stew. He, um, he fell off a cliff last night. <laughs> so, you know, certainly he wasn't slaughtered or anything, but it'd be a shame to let it go to waste now that we have all this delicious meat, right? 
we still have cold stress, right? And we're still incurring damage that needs protein to repair it, so you cannot exist purely on carbohydrate, right? You need protein in that diet, and meat is a pretty damn good source, right? Similarly, the Sherpas do also drink plenty of milk, butter, cheese, right? So yaks, actually female yaks, which are known as knacks, technically, uh, give milk, right? And that's always been a resource. Last aspect of diet, and this is very interesting for those of you that are keen on health, salt. All right. The use of salt in the Tibetan diet, the Sherpa diet, is super important because one interesting thing about high, high altitude areas is that they're usually landlocked and far away from the sea, right? No oceans very close to Mount Everest. Most of us get our salt in the form of sea salt, especially people who live close to the sea. Those of us who live in downtown Scarborough in the year 2014, we get our salt from the supermarket where it is iodized. So iodine gets added to your salt. Why do we add iodine to salt? Yes. It helps with your thyroid function. Yeah. If you are deficient in iodine, you can end up suffering health problems. Thyroid disease, very common. Does anyone have thyroid disease? I mean, lots of people have it now. I have it. Uh, you can also develop goiter. Certain birth defects are associated with iodine deficiency and thyroid problems. Historically, the Sherpas did not use sea salt. They used rock salt. They would just dig it out of the hillsides all around them, right? Rock salt, no iodine. And as a result, when you know, foreign explorers started to encounter the Sherpas years and years ago, one of the first things they noticed was, wow, look at how many of these people have these great big goiters. Right? Great big inflamed lumps at the bottom of their necks. Right? Cretinism is a birth defect that's a result of iodine deficiency. It's essentially a developmental delay. That was quite common. Thyroid problems, relatively common. And actually, deaf mutism relatively common among the Sherpas, and primarily as a result of rock salt instead of iodized salt. Not a lot of seafood, right? Not a lot of seaweed, not a lot of fish, no sea salt. So this landlocked diet is super great, but it comes at some costs. Right? And we talked about the same with the Inuit last week. The diet is awesome in a lot of ways, but there are some gaps. And in terms of the Sherpa diet, that's the big one. All right. Obviously, today we can accommodate this very easily simply by carrying up some iodized salt into the hills. Everyone uses that and they're fine. We don't need tons of iodine, we just need a bit. But if you're deficient in it, there will be serious consequences. So let's talk about social values. <laughs> Hospitality is a massively important value among the Sherpas. This made it a really great place to do research. Because every time you walked by somebody's door, they would invite you in, which made it like, really easy, really friendly. There were two things that people would offer you when you walked into their house. Putting on your ecologist's hat, can you guess what they would offer you? Tea and potatoes. Why do they want to offer you tea? What's one of the stresses of the altitude environment? Cold, absolutely. Yeah, they offer you a hot drink. That's their tradition. Not whiskey or a cold beer or something. They give you something hot to drink. Right? It's adaptive. It's adjustive. Second knock-on effect, and this is interesting, it's milk tea with lots of sugar, lots of milk, and then chai leaves. Right? So it's a very high calorie drink, plenty of fat, plenty of sugar, and because it's a black tea, plenty of caffeine. Some good evidence that under work, the diuretic effect of caffeine is mitigated. So when you're exercising, you're not going to lose more water right, for taking in caffeine. And the caffeine might help your body to metabolize fat when you exercise. And in a hypoxic environment, you're always exercising. Right? So tea addresses a handful of key needs. The other is potatoes. I told you you've never seen someone eat potatoes until you've seen a Sherpa eat potatoes. They want to stuff you full of carbohydrates, right? <laughs> when we think of the sort of fatty snacks or the protein-filled snacks that you might get somewhere else, here, have a bowl of peanuts. Absolutely not. All I want is a bowl full of starch. 
right? Long chain carbohydrates. Why? Because they're so rich in ATP and that's going to go directly into my heart and brain. Help them to work hard at high altitude. There has historically not really been much of a social class system among the Sherpas. There was instead what we would call a tradition of big men or big families. So a big man, and this is somewhat sexist, but this is how we go. A big man is somebody who had achieved social status. A big man's children might be as well, big. But you're not elected in the way that a chief would be, and you're not recognized with a formal title. Right? You're simply esteemed by your fellow villagers because you're quite successful. Maybe you've had great crops. Maybe your livestock are very numerous or something. But you're afforded a little bit of extra respect. Maybe you have a little bit more sway when the village sits down to make some decisions about something on a political level. Right? So you did have a big man, small man sort of social effect happening and a tradition of sponsorship. Sponsors were sort of traditionally known as a jindak. A sponsor is a big man who takes you under his wing, helps you out. Just like when Nike starts giving, you know, a baseball player a few million dollars to hit home runs, so a big man could start giving a little man some extra food, a bit of work around the farm, things like that. There was no form of indentured labor, no form of servitude or slavery. Generally, people worked their own farms themselves, but through cagey trade, through clever crop rotations, things like that, you might be able to become a bit more successful than your neighbors and start to achieve a bit more status and preeminence in the community. All right. We're going to talk a little bit more about the sponsorship idea under the rubric of religion because it gets very important uh, and it's interesting. Lastly, let's talk about a couple of other sort of social values. One would be cheerfulness. I mentioned the Sherpas are remarkably happy people and we see under high stress environments, this is a common enough response. Remember last week we talked about never in anger, right? The ethnography about the Inuit that Anger, frustration, lashing out, rage, these are unacceptable forms of social expression in the Arctic. In a high stress environment, you need to get along, right? Hunting has to be cooperative. Meat sharing has to be cooperative, right? You need to build social relationships all the time. So we see the same among the Sherpas. Not nearly as pronounced as in the Arctic, but we might say this is still an, an environment of relatively high stress. Hypoxia is never ending. And it is hard on us. And so people get along, in short, because they have to get along. That's how you make it work. And then lastly, this idea of entrepreneurship. Being a big man, being a member of a big family is not a problem. It's not seen as being bad. It's a good thing. People are encouraged to achieve social success right, through striking out on their own, trying new things, taking risks trading, going further. So we see a real tradition now among the Sherpas of sending your kids off to private school. Right? If you've become truly big, if you've tapped into the international tourist market or something and you have lots of cash, you fly your children to Australia to go to university or something. So there's still plenty of entrepreneurial spirit, but that's tied up socially with a strong tradition of obligation. That if you get big, you owe something to the community. So let's talk about that. This is the monastery at Tengbache. I think it's the most beautiful place in the world. Oh. Right in this valley, it's surrounded by rhododendron trees and monkeys, and the Everest is right there, and a couple of other of the most beautiful mountains in the world are right there. And then this gorgeous, centuries-old Tibetan Buddhist monastery. And it's the friendliest place. You sort of walk past and stick your head in, and they say, hey, do you want to come on in? We're about to start prayers. We'll pour you a cup of tea, of course. <laughs> and you can sit down and have some tea and then watch the monks doing their thing like I'm doing here. It's extremely cold in there. You can see the steam like pouring off the kettle of tea, right? Uh, so, we said that the Sherpas are Buddhist. They are, strictly speaking, Nyingmapa Buddhists. So this is a sect of Buddhism that will be pretty different from the one that you might see in, in 
further south or further east in Asia, very, very closely informed by traditional Tibetan beliefs. All right, so there is a mix of classical Buddhism with animism, beliefs in local spirits, local deities, ascribing spiritual properties to certain of the landscape, right? So mountains have names that are related to their role, right? Mount Everest is Komalangma, the mother of the snow. So among the sort of key traditions that we see here, first is the monastic tradition. Lots of nuns, lots of monks. In Tibet, you can get at any given time up to 20% of a community population living in a monastery. One in five people shaving their heads and wearing robes and living in the monastery. So you have a huge devotion to service in the faith. Just about everyone will have had some experience of being a monk, even if it was just temporarily. You might have gone off for six months to the monastery, and then you move back into your village, you marry somebody, and you live a normal life. But high, high exposure. All right. The tradition is that these monasteries are supported by the communities themselves and in exchange offer leadership and advice and so on to the communities. Now, we spoke about diet, we spoke about generosity and obligation among Nyingmapa Buddhists, strong, strong tradition of giving alms, giving offerings to people who are begging. The thought is that this is good for two reasons, right? It's good for you, and it's good for the beggar. It's good for you because it allows you to be generous, right? Being generous is good. Giving people something that you have is a nice thing to do. It's good for the beggar because the beggar has offered you the chance to be generous. If there was no beggar, you would never get to be generous, right? You would never earn the merit that comes with giving something to someone. So the idea of sponsorship is bound up in this idea that there always has to be a give and take, right? That you're not, by offering alms to someone, somehow above that person. In fact, you're both equal partners in this alm-giving relationship. They're letting you be generous, and you're being generous. Buddhists also offer, as we saw last week among the Inuit, some healing practices, Buddhist medicine, so people could visit a monastery if they were feeling sick. Um, and play a role in community building. So one of the things that I found in my research, if, if somebody went into a monastery saying, gosh, I've been feeling really crummy lately, what would often happen is, among other things, the Buddhists might say, the monks might say, what you should do is go back to your village and, and help build a nice little trail through the middle of town. That would make you feel better. Right? Would allow you to reintegrate with the community. Remember last week we talked about the woman who felt sick. And how did she get better? She got some meat from her friend through the radio, right? This was a process of reintegrating her with her friends. She needed something to eat, but she also needed to reach out to other people, get reintegrated into the community. In this case, we might say that these monasteries play a central role in kind of helping to regulate social relations, right. directing people to be generous, directing redistribution efforts. You should give some of what you have to them over there. That would make you feel better. It would make you a better person, right? So then that brings us to our last couple of examples, and I'm glad that we have some time left, because this is oh, so fascinating. Uh, Tibetan sky burial is the process uh, of leaving a corpse yeah, out in an exposed area so that it can be picked apart by meat-eating birds. That's a simple answer. I mean, there are all kinds of processes that go along with the preparation of the body and so on. But in short, yes, rather than being buried, rather than being cremated, you get left to the birds. Now, this is not universal in Tibet. And we're talking specifically more about Tibet now and not Nepal. Uh, sky burial is a little less common among the Sherpas uh, than it is among Tibetans. If you are a very high-ranking, let's say, priest, a, a lama, in a monastery, you would not be uh, subject to sky burial, you would be cremated. Why don't we cremate everybody in Tibet? If it's good enough for the very best, why doesn't everyone get cremated? Yeah. It's an energy problem. Very few trees, right? And if you're using things like yak dung and so on to heat your house, 
then the idea of chopping down a big beautiful tree, remember low biological productivity, that tree has taken ages to grow. Using that fuel wood to burn a body feels like a bit of a waste. Why not bury people? Yeah. Okay, so low biological productivity might mean that using up good land for a graveyard is a waste. What do you think? Right. You're in a hypoxic environment with marginal soils, rocky substrate. Digging graves is super hard work. <laughs> it's just super hard work. So this idea of sky burial is not totally random. All right, we see it in other places. You guys are making a good ecological argument. Digging is very hard work, right? And cremation is uh, inefficient. It's a, it's a poor use of resources. I would like to change your minds and suggest that it is not purely ecological. I would like to suggest <gasps> that it is cultural. And I think today I can do it. I'm, I'm optimistic. All right, so first things first. We've said that these people are Buddhists, right? Yes? Nyingma pa Buddhists. So, a mixture of Tibetan animism and classical Buddhism, these people by and large are ascribing spiritual relationships to the landscape around them. That means that these birds and the hills that they live in, for instance, would all have their own characteristics, their own properties. I think that there's something sort of fundamentally beautiful about the idea of bits of your body getting carried off into the sky by birds after you die. I mean, first of all, I think it's just a pleasant kind of symbolic process. But it would also be spiritually important since as far as Nyingma Buddhists are concerned, when you're dead, your body's nothing. It's just a piece of meat. It's just an empty vessel. There is no specific symbolic spiritual importance attached to the corpse, right? Once you've moved on, your body is just a shell. So, what could you do with that leftover piece of meat? Well, we've seen that this is a culture that heavily values this process of redistribution and sponsorship. So what would be a nice thing for you to do with your body? Yes. You could give it away to somebody else who could use it, like a bird. Right? You don't need it anymore. Why not offer them something to eat? Just like giving some money to the beggar, right? That is good for you. You're offering something on. You're being generous. And the birds, in turn, are letting you be generous. So this is a great way to be buried, right, in the sky. It'd be a waste to throw a perfectly good corpse underground, right, where it's just going to turn over for a million years. Why not let the birds have at it? That would be kind, wouldn't it? You seem unconvinced. I think, yes. Why don't the highest of the high do it? A great question. If it's good enough for the average person, why isn't it good enough for the Lama? Presumably, there must be some higher symbolic importance attached to fire. And is there? There is. So one of the most sacred parts of a Sherpa household is the hearth, where you cook dinner, right? And so, for instance, if you wandered into such a house and you had some Kleenex in your pocket, throwing it in the fire would be super taboo. That would be really offensive, because the fire itself is sacred. So then, presumably, fire being special, that's something that we reserve for the most special, and it's a cost, right? We can't afford maybe to throw fire at everybody, so we save that. Yes? Uh, isn't it Buddhism a thing where the Lama is supposed to be reincarnated, so the fire is going to like, back to life? Yeah, is there this question of reincarnation? Absolutely, reincarnation is a, a, a belief here locally. Um, the most famous example is the Dalai Lama, right? And every time that the, the Dalai Lama, there are, there are historically many of them, when one dies, then the search begins for the, the reincarnation of essentially the same Dalai Lama in a different body. And sometimes we find it in a five-year-old boy over in this village, and sometimes we find it in a 10-year-old over in that village. But you're looking around for the reincarnate 
So after that process is done, after you've achieved your spiritual goals for this life, then your body, as we said, is just a shell. The more important part is that you're moving on, your spirit is moving on. Maybe to incarnate another body or to go on and achieve nirvana right, forever. Now, number one, so we've said this is a question of generosity. Number two, thank you, we've talked about Buddhist beliefs of impermanence. Nothing lasts forever. You're going to be reincarnated anyway, right? You might as well shuffle off this mortal coil and begin the trip again, right? Symbolically, I argue these are at least as important as our ecological concerns. If digging a grave is too much work, then why did someone build the Taj Mahal? Because that's a grave, right, that somebody built. They considered it worth it, right? So, one thing that you learn as an anthropologist, humans are very, very practical. They're also totally irrational. They have <laughs> an incredible capacity for both of those things. So I'm going to argue that I think maybe sky burial is at least as much of a cultural phenomenon as an ecological one. You guys may disagree. Do you disagree? Of course. No. <laughs> ah, yes. Um, All right. So I think I saw a video in Mongolia where similar practices are held, and Mongolia is Definitely. pretty much grasslands. So yes, high altitude sort of plateau in Mongolia. Yes. And uh, they perform sky burials. There we go. Anywhere else that sky burials happen? Yes. Ancient Persia, thank you, Zoroastrians, yes. Exactly, these sort of round towers, right? Where do the Zoroastrians live? In ancient Persia, is this a high altitude environment? It is not. Is it a cold environment? It is not, right? It's dry. Are these people Buddhists? They are not. So Zoroastrianism, gave us an example of Zoroastrianism, an ancient, ancient religion uh, in Persia, essentially Iran. Right? That tradition spread and we find sky burial processes similar to that happening even in parts of India. Right? So there is some sort of cultural migration effect where this tradition was perceived in some parts of the world and other people thought, that's a good way of doing things. Right? Whereas the Tibetans leave the body out in the open, essentially, just like that, uh, the Zoroastrians would build these, yeah, special structures, round structures. They were almost like a, like a courtyard or something. Eh? And you just put the body in the middle of it, and then the animals can come in and have at it. Fascinating. The Zoroastrian tradition, we believe, comes from a, a set of ideas about the corpse being unclean, right? About the possibility of ritual pollution. Those of you who are cultural anthropologists are going to remember Mary Douglas, I hope. <gasps> I hope. Douglas was a cultural anthropologist who said, if you want to understand how people behave, you need to understand how they feel about what is clean and what is dirty. Right? That is it. It's not about hygiene. It's about making categories, and stuff that falls into one category or another. For us, we have the living and the dead, right? We have male, female, things like that. And things that trouble those boundaries cause us difficulties. We want to categorize the entire universe and so the definition of dirty is not about hygiene. It's stuff that belongs in the garbage can and stuff that doesn't. Stuff that belongs on the table and stuff that doesn't. If a leaf is lying on the grass, the grass is not dirty, right? But if those leaves are lying on your table, your table is dirty, right? Lying on the carpet. Now you've got to clean up the carpet because it got dirty, because that matter is out of place. And so we would say this is the sort of driving force of this Zoroastrian tradition of sky burial because handling a corpse was a bad idea, right? And that long drawn out funeral processes, mummification, cremation, things like that, they involve too much time with the dead body. So the best way to handle it is to wrap that body up and plunk it in this tower so that it can be picked apart, right? By birds, by animals, and then it's out of your hands. You save yourself the possibility of some sort of symbolic uh, soiling, contamination, right? Okay. I want to make sure that we have enough time for this one, too. <gasps> okay, who read the article about fraternal polyandry? All right, what can you tell us about fraternal polyandry? What is it? Um, so basically, essentially what it is is brothers will marry one woman. So you'll have the elder brother marry his wife, and then his wife will marry the younger brothers who will also be married the same woman. <laughs> 
sure does. Yes, thank you. So we have lots of examples in the ethnographic record. We have lots of examples today of cultures where a man takes multiple wives, right? Polygyny, we're familiar with that term. We don't have too many examples of cases where a woman takes multiple husbands. Hmm. And that historically has been a source of, of quizzical concern. Uh, I'm sure some of you are scratching your heads right now. One of the places where we find women taking multiple husbands is in Tibet. Sort of a classic case study of what we call fraternal polyandry. Polyandry, multiple husbands, fraternal, those husbands are brothers. So, that means that if a man has two or three brothers, so this means that if a man has two or three brothers, the oldest one marries someone, marries a woman, and all of his younger brothers then automatically get married to her too. So good news, ladies. Like a package deal. You'd better hope, <laughs> yeah, that whoever the oldest guy is, is uh, that he's got some cool brothers. So this has always been one of these quizzical sort of phenomena. We could imagine in the, the most blunt Darwinian sense, we could imagine why a man would want multiple wives, right? Why? What do you think? More offspring. More offspring. That's right. Humans have a nine-month gestation. So a woman can only have a baby a year or something. But if a man has multiple wives, he could theoretically impregnate them at a shocking rate, right? You could have as many kids as you wanted, one after the other every nine months. From Darwin's point of view, this is a good thing, right? You're passing on your genetic material. You win the race, right? So then in theory, the opposite would apply to polyandry. What's the argument against a woman taking multiple husbands? Yeah. So we think that there's an ecological explanation for it. We think that there probably has to be because, again, Darwin 101, the sort of bluntest Darwinian argument would say, men don't want to share a wife. Why not? If your mission in Darwin's book is to pass on your genetic material, right? Whose baby is it? That's the question. If multiple husbands share a single wife and she bears them a child, they could never know for sure who the father was. And from Darwin's point of view, that's bad. Why? Because you want your genetic material to get passed on, not your brother's, right? So this would, in some sense, weaken your ability to see that your offspring succeeded. I mean, you could care for that child of yours, but you're not 100% sure that it's yours. It might be your brother's, or your other brother's, or your other brother's. <laughs> So, for years, I think people were sort of stumped by this idea. Uh, why on earth? You could also imagine the sexist interpretations of this, right? So, I imagine a bunch of old sort of bearded British guys 150 years ago smoking pipes and saying, oh, God, why letting a woman be in charge, right? <laughs> imagine that. Uh, <laughs> so, it, it reverses a lot of cultural stereotypes about sexual control, right? Sexual jealousy, power. So it's a really troubling phenomenon. As you said, for years the explanation was ecological. We said that farming is hard work at high altitude because you're hypoxic, right? Therefore, a clever woman wants lots of guys around <laughs> to help with the farming. Honey, why don't you go take care of the potatoes today? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a cup of tea, <laughs> she says, right? And if there were three or four of those strapping, handsome men around, they could take care of all the work. We also said that there's probably a problem with biological productivity. Not of humans, but of the fields. If you have 100 acres, and you give birth to four sons, and you need to subdivide that land for each of them when they get married, then they're only going to have 25 acres each. And if they each have a few sons, right, within the space of a few generations, you're down to some tiny, tiny farms. Whereas, if you keep tracing the inheritance of property through the male line, but make all of those guys marry the same woman, farm stays intact, right? 
So it minimizes the likelihood that you're going to chop up your productivity. You ensure that a nice big productive parcel of land and all the stuff on it gets inherited whole cloth instead of subdivided, right, and weakened. So the argument was that maybe this is ecological. Maybe this is about humans trying to respond to their environment. That would be a very Marvin Harris thing to say. Marvin Harris, Mr. Holy Cow, right, from India. People are faced with this pressure, so what do they do? Well, they're going to switch up how they organize their lives. I wonder. First of all, the Darwinian argument, I mean, you could modify this to say that if you're not going to raise your own kids, you could at least raise your brothers. Biologically, genetically, they're the next best thing, right? If you can't have kids of your own, you should at least invest in your nieces and nephews. That makes sense. An element of your genetic material is being passed on. It's just a generation old. That's still your parents' DNA, right? So there might be some biological reason to invest in that, eh? we could argue. Culturally, though, I'm interested in this. Turns out, this might be about taxes. Yeah. Aren't taxes the worst? My wife and I nearly got married purely for the sake of our immigration papers. I don't know if anybody can relate to that. What did I say about humans? We can be irrational, but we can also be really pragmatic sometimes, right? Really unromantic. So maybe, if she and I were going to run down to City Hall and do a quick marriage, maybe you could imagine, ladies, marrying like three brothers just to save some money on your taxes. <laughs> Turns out, there are some more social classes in Tibet, in classical Tibetan society, than we see among the Sherpas. The Sherpa is much more egalitarian. In Tibet, you had classes of aristocrats who owned land, of landholders who would rent that land from the aristocrats, and then of landless peasants who would work the land. Peasants, relatively low rates of fraternal polyandry. The highest rates, farmers, landowners. Well, oh, sorry, land users. Why? Because... They got taxed on their farms. And the tax structure was arranged such that the best way to dodge the highest rates was to keep your farm intact. Right? You had to pay head taxes and, and, and owe tithes to your masters in terms of produce, animals, and so on. And the most effective way of dodging high rates of taxation, it also turns out, was by keeping husbands married to the same woman, keeping brothers, sorry, married to the same woman, and keeping the family land in a single piece rather than subdivided into multiple farms that would attract more taxes on their own. So as much as we have some ecological arguments, I think there are some cultural ones too. It's all about taxes, sex and taxes. Very exciting. Is anyone convinced? Do you buy it? Yes? Go on. Now, sorry, why could they not afford to have a wife? What do you mean by that? Well, the, for example, if the brother's family was poor, yep. then they wouldn't be able to afford to have a family. Hmm. So they would give all the brothers. So you'd have your grandmother want to you know, your only son wants to have To pay for the price. We're talking about a dowry here, essentially. Bride wealth. So marriages can be expensive, right? As a guy, if you want to take in a wife, there are lots of traditions of this around the world, right? In which you need to pay, essentially, the family of your in-laws, essentially, the family of the bride, more money in order to bring her into your family. So maybe this is a way of sidestepping that. You only pay one dowry, but four people get to marry her. <laughs> Shocking. Fascinating. Huh. And as well, if the, uh, if the family didn't have a lot of money, the idea was Yeah. So if you've got a context of sort of limited resources, if you've got lots of people at any one time that are out of the reproduction pool because they're in a monastery, right? Your reproductive, we have high neonate mortality at high altitude. Remember, that's a stress. Do we think that factors in? It could. If you're wanting to pour a lot of energy into your offspring, right, consolidate the family. Interesting. Isn't ecological anthropology the best? Isn't this great?